All right, all right, you've joined us for part two in this series called A Life-Giving Christmas. And as you just heard uh, from Denise on our leadership team, this is a phenomenal time of year. It's a great opportunity for you to invite others to experience God in a life-giving way. And that's especially what we'll be communicating on Christmas Eve, the good news. So do pick up those invites on your way out. But for you today... Uh, We really pray for you, and we really pray over each of these messages and each of these series. And as we prayed about the month of December, we know how busy it is, how demanding it is. And our heart, our desire is that every weekend in the Word of God this month would just give life to you, that you'd have a life-giving Christmas. Saw a really funny video the other day of a little guy with the cutest little British accent And he's talking with his mom about the role that he got in the Christmas pageant. And he says it's a classic role, but it's a little bit cute as you discover what the classic role is. Go ahead and take a look. Guess what I am for the nativity? I'm a classic one. Classic role, is it? Classic part? Yeah. Um, Joseph? No. Uh, uh, One of the three wise men? No. But it's a classic part? Yeah. Okay, um... You tell me then, because... I'm door holder number three, I'll be holding doors. That's amazing! Holding doors for who? Um, probably, um, Joseph and Mary. Oh my gosh, were you pleased when they said that? And I was like, I'm a door holder, get in there, let's go, (laughs) yes. I'll have to wear, like, brown. Really? Yeah, probably. Excellent. That's, well, that's really smart, Milo. Isn't that great? <laughs> Door holder number three. What I love about that is this. Live long enough and you'll find yourself playing some role that you didn't expect. Maybe you wanted the part of Joseph and you got the part of door holder number three. Maybe you wanted the part of married and you got the part of single. Maybe you wanted the part of mom and that hasn't been your role yet. Uh, what can you do when you find yourself playing a different part than you expected in life? You expected the promotion, and instead the coworker who's so cruel and just an outright liar gets the promotion, and you don't. What can you do when that's your story in life? Uh, Luke 1, verse 29, Mary, the moment the angel comes to her, this messenger of God, she's a teenager, she's engaged. And this messenger appears with this unthinkable message from God. It's these three little words we could easily overlook in the Christmas story, but I just think they're so important that Mary was confused and disturbed. I don't know, over in Avon this morning, someone online, someone here in the room in Brownsburg, right now there's something in your life that those three words would describe you pretty well. Confused and disturbed. Mary's entire life plan gets turned upside down. I mean, her dream for her life is never going to happen. And there are sometimes twists and turns in our lives where the very dream we had, it's just like that is never going to happen. So Mary's trying to think, what in the world could this angel mean? What, what is going on? Let's uh, dig a little deeper in our lives and ask this. What can you do when you're confused or when your life has been disturbed? What can you do when when just what's going on in the world disturbs you? I mean, this last week, one of our local schools here that many of our students go to, there was a bomb threat. All the kids had to evacuate the building. You talk about just frightening. Frightening. For every student, for every parent, like, what do you do in that situation? Confused and disturbed. Mary can relate to you. I can relate to you. God can relate to you. Believe it or not, the Christmas story starts with God being in heaven, a place where there's no sickness, there's no death, there's no pain, and yet God was confused and disturbed, not about his comfort, but about our discomfort, about the evil that plagues planet Earth. And here's the reality. The thing that confuses or disturbs you in your life, whether it's cancer, whether it's divorce, injustice, racism, 
bomb threats and every form of evil, including what we see in the Middle East right now, they're actually all connected under the surface. And God is disturbed about all of it, not confused, but disturbed. He knows all things, and yet he gave us a free will, and with our free will, the people who came before us and we ourselves, we often mess up the planet he gave us, the relationships he gave us. And so the true Christmas story is very much a story of people being confused and disturbed, but that's not the end, that's the beginning. And for you, if you'll place your faith in God today, whether for the first time or in a renewed way to say, God, I want your plan for my life. Jesus, I believe you're God and you died for me on the cross. The moment you turn to Jesus, confused and disturbed, changes from being the end of your story or the theme of your story to just the beginning of your story. Mary's story continues in verse 38. Mary responds to this angel Now, keep in mind, what the angel has told her is the opposite of what she's planned for her life. You know, we we talk about the American dream. Mary probably had the Judean dream at this time. You know, there were a lot of barriers. They were under the Roman government. They They were essentially a nation on house arrest. They had to pay these exorbitant taxes. And yet, there were still weddings and funerals and births. And people adapt. People adjust. Like all her friends, Mary's most likely planning to live the Judean dream, which is what? Get married, have a bunch of kids, all the holidays and all the feasts and festivals, have a bunch of people around you that you can love, because really that's about all you can control under Roman rule. And in this moment, this angel appears and says, God has a plan for you. You're going to become pregnant before you're married, which is the biggest taboo in that culture, way bigger than our culture. This is a shame honor culture. It's a very shameful thing. She'd be disgraced. This is why she leaves for the first three months of her pregnancy. This is not good news for Mary. It might be good news for the world in the end. But in the moment, this is not comfortable. This is not ideal. This is unexpected. And the very word of God without error says she was confused And she was disturbed. And yet, after the angel explains, here's God's plan. I just love Mary's answer. It shows her high view of God. I am the Lord's servant. What if where there's confusion in your life, what if where you're disturbed in your life, you not only prayed for God to resolve it, and you should pray for that, but what if you also prayed, God, Make me your servant within this. Because the pain that I'm feeling is just a small fraction. It's a drop in the ocean of the worldwide pain that evil has caused for all people everywhere. So God, while I pray that you'd heal my situation, I also come to you with the heart of Mary that says, use me as your servant in a plan that's bigger than just fixing what's broken in my life, but a plan that will fix what's broken in every life in all of the world. And then you talk about surrender. Mary essentially says there in the second half of verse 38, may God's plan for my life, which I just learned about and is totally different than what I've been counting on for 14 or 15 years, may that happen. Because God's bigger, he's better, he knows best. So I surrender to him. Choose to be God's servant in his plan to defeat evil. This is, this is your best path forward when you find yourself confused or disturbed. You, you choose to be God's servant in his plan to defeat evil. He will resolve your pain through Jesus' work on the cross, whether in this life or the next. And he wants to resolve the pain of millions of people, billions of people, of nations. And he actually wants to use you in that plan. That's why you're still on earth. That's why you woke up today. That's why I woke up. You get to be part of seeing resolution and healing, not only for your life, but for the lives of others as well. Choose to be God's servant. Here's the reality. Whether you believe in God or not, whether you choose God in your pain or not, 
you will have confusion in your life and there will be times when your life is disrupted. It's not like, hey, um, choose to believe in God because then you'll get a bunch of confusion and disruption in your life. Now, sometimes when we follow Jesus on the narrow road, there are things that are confusing to us, but we need to, to back up and understand everyone's life will have pain in it. Everyone will have to deal with cancer at some point or a car accident at some point or a bankruptcy or a divorce or the loss of a child or the loss of a parent or the loss of a sibling. We all will. And so when you don't choose to be God's servant in it, you're still going to go through it. You're just not going to have a purpose in it. But when you say in your confusion, in your disruption, in the pain of your life, God, I choose to be your servant. Yes, I want your healing for me, but I want you to use me to heal others as well. Now, through your pain, you're propelled by purpose. You're carried along, and it starts to become fulfilling. It starts to become an adventure rather than just, I wake up every day and I just try to avoid pain. I'm living on a mission. This can take a thousand different forms, and I actually believe every single one of you, if you've placed your faith in Jesus... And if you haven't yet, you can do that today, even during this message. Just call out to him to be your Savior and your Lord, the God of your life. Every one of us, God has unique ministries for you that no one else in all of history can do. Ephesians 2 verse 10 is where God says that in his word. There's things for you that no one else can do. One of the great heroes to me in our church movement is a mom who found herself a widow within the last few years here. Her husband uh, died of cancer unexpectedly. He's with the Lord in heaven. She knows she's going to see him again. And in that unthinkable pain, as she has just chosen God and she's led her kids to keep looking to God and her small group has come around her and a lot of those dads in the small group are being father figures to her kids You know what I heard recently? She has started a ministry. It's not like it has a website and a title. It's just something she does. When she finds a mom in our church whose husband gets a terminal diagnosis, cancer or something else, she goes right away to that mom who will become a widow, unless God does a miracle, and she starts to minister. Not just comfort, but also here's all the paperwork. Here's all the legal things you're going to have to do. Here, here's everything I had to go through in the last few years, and I'm going to walk with you through it. Talk about purpose. Talk about fulfilling. You talk about God taking what was meant for evil by Satan when he introduced death into our world, turning it for good so that others can see the goodness of God when they walk through the most difficult days of their life. She discovered that because she said, God, I'm your servant. My life's pretty disrupted. It's pretty painful, but I choose to serve you. I wonder what could this look like in your life right now? What could this mentality, this attitude of saying, though there's pain in my life and I could obsess on that and I could, I, I, you know, from what the culture tells me, I would be justified to throw a pity party for the rest of my life, but instead... I'm going to see that God is bigger. I'm going to believe that he works all things for good. And I'm going to choose to be like Mary. And I'm going to say, I am the Lord's servant. God, if you allowed this, then you have a plan to work it for good. It's a posture of the heart that will reveal itself in your time, in your treasure. You see, God's plan to bring the Messiah who will solve death and pain for all who believe the way is open to everyone. Mary gets to play this huge role in it, but it doesn't mean she's going to have an easy life. In fact, the day will come when her firstborn son will be suspended on a Roman torture device called a cross, pierced through his hands and his feet, and he will look down, and as he's gasping, and he's been stripped naked, and he's bleeding, and he's been tortured, and with his final gasps, he's going to look into his mother's eyes. We know from the Gospel of John, she was that close, and John the disciple, he's going to say, take care of my mom for me. The path to greatness 
is not usually an easy path, but it's the best path. Now, that went pretty deep and pretty heavy. I'm going to lift us up a little more to maybe where you walked in here today. When you look at the Christmas story, there's all these characters, shepherds, angels, prophets, Mary, Joseph, wise men. But really, they all play one of four key roles that God always uses in his plan to redeem the world. And God's still using these four roles today. Now, here they are. The angels had the role of inviting people to come and worship Jesus. The prophets had the role 700 years before uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem when he came from heaven to earth to say the Messiah is coming, he'll be born of a virgin. Mary and Joseph, they had a role to serve. As we just said, I'm going to be God's servant in the midst of this. The wise men, you've heard of them. They you know, weren't Jewish. They traveled from far eastern lands. And what you might not know is those gifts, those famous gifts that you see in nativity scenes, the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh, those were very valuable commodities. It could have been two to three years worth of salary, of labor. And that is going to be what Joseph and Mary live off of. Because to kind of give you a spoiler alert in this story, Herod, who was like a picture of Satan, an expression of demonic evil at the time, when he finds out that the Jewish Messiah has been born, he gets jealous because his title is king of the Jews. Well, his self-appointed title. So he literally sends out his army and Roman soldiers go in and they kill all the baby boys under the age of two in a genocidal effort to wipe out this king of the Jews. But God warned Joseph in a dream, flee to Egypt. So Joseph took Mary to Egypt. They lived there for probably a couple years. How do they live in a culture where they don't know the language? Guess what happens to that gold and frankincense and myrrh? It most likely gets traded in for food, for lodging. That gift, which was an expression of worship, was used by God to literally sustain, to give bread to Mary who would give milk to the Messiah. I mean, think about that. Guys, when you give to the work of God as an act of worship, it's no less tangible in the work of God. And then the role of praying. We saw last week the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. If you missed it or if you're dealing with unanswered prayers in your life, you should check out that message. They prayed for decades. And God uses their prayers as well as the prayers of thousands of others, perhaps millions of others over those 700 years. God used all four of these quadrants. They're pillars of the Christmas story. And God still works today in these ways. Now, as you grow in Christ, your life should show some signs of health in all four of these areas. And at the same time, you've been uniquely gifted by God to be above average in one of these four areas. We we should all be inviting people to Jesus. We should all be serving. We should all be giving something to the Lord, returning a portion of what he gives to us. We should all be praying. And yet there are people who have a gift of faith who pray at a higher level. There's people who have gifts of service who serve at a higher level. There's people to whom God has entrusted worldly wealth, which will someday burn up and will mean nothing to any of us 100 years from now, and they get to invest it like the gold and frankincense and myrrh to actually generate salvation and spiritual change. And then there's people who are just, God wired you to be an extrovert. Anywhere you go, you don't meet a stranger, you know the whole town, guess what? We're all called to invite, but you've got a special gift to invite. So I wonder of those four, for you, not your neighbor, but where has God most equipped you as you think about this Christmas season? You should be doing some of all four, but... An honest look at your life compared to an average person, a normal person in our church, where is it that God has entrusted more to you than to others? And here's my question for you. I believe it's God's question for us today. What would going all out for God and his work for others, what would that look like for you? 
What if you knew for sure that Jesus promises that he will return, that the believers will be raptured to heaven and he will be a just judge and a king of kings and he will rule with a rod and he will judge every terrorist, every act of evil, Satan and the demons themselves he'll throw into the lake of fire, death itself he will destroy and there will be no more death and then we'll be with him in every house we had on earth, every a bank account, every asset, it's all going to be burned up, but everything we put into the kingdom will be there forever. What if you knew for sure he was coming back on December 26th? How much would you invite? How much would you give? How many services would you serve at? Or how many ways would you serve outside of this building like that widow I described earlier? How much would you pray for the people you know who aren't yet on their way to heaven? I was opening Christmas cards earlier this week. It's always fun to get all the updated pictures of families. And one of the things we pray for here as a ministry, because Jesus taught us to pray this way, is John 15. Jesus says that we should pray for fruit that is changed lives. And then he says this, fruit that remains. So we celebrate every decision, every baptism, but we really celebrate when it's been three or four years and that person is still walking with God and their life is transforming, their marriage is transforming. That's why I get up in the morning. That's what we get to do as a church. Uh, It's so fulfilling. (laughs) I, I just hope you'll make this your goal in life to be part of this. It's what God created you to do. And it's so much more fulfilling than any career or any material thing was opening one of these Christmas cards and uh, my eyes just watered up with tears when I saw this precious family. It's a family, they're actually at the service, but I can't look at them or I'll cry. So (laughs) I see you guys though, I saw you earlier. Um, You know, you think of all the brokenness in the world. There are things like drug addiction. There are things like broken relationships. There are, are kids who are with Child Protective Services instead of with their parents. There are people who are homeless and jobless. And humans make a lot of good efforts to solve these problems, but the the real most lasting solution to these problems is getting people to Jesus and then getting them into a local church, which is the body of Christ, where they get to be fully transformed. And so this is a couple where People from our church, being the hands and feet of Christ, met them and loved them. And when they decided to place their faith in Christ, where their story was a lot of those things I described before, addiction to an extreme of homelessness and division and loss and brokenness and rock bottom, that it wasn't just a dramatic salvation moment, but as men of God and women of God from our church have discipled this husband and wife They've both become trophies in the trophy case of God, trophies of grace. And their marriage is, you know, none of ours are perfect, and they wouldn't pretend that theirs is, but it's a vibrant marriage. And now their role as parents, being the Christian parents God designed them to be, and knowing that this picture is in their home, and knowing the good careers that they're engaged in, This is God's solution to unemployment. This is God's solution to homelessness, to addiction. It's Jesus. And just as Mary had a role to play, so do you and me. Let's look back at those four quadrants. Because if you think of just that one family in our church and they're representative of many more, there's someone who invited them. There's many who've served in discipling them and even served holding the doors and being in Kids City every week that they're here. There was a building for them to walk into. There was an environment and the lights were on, the utilities were paid. A, A ministry that runs with excellence as it points people to God because of all of you who give. You're part of that story. That story happened because of you. And that story, and many others like it, are the answers to the prayers of our prayer warriors in our movement. 
Those of you who, when you pray on any given day, you don't just ask God for your bullet list of things you want for yourself, but you actually say, Father, let your kingdom come and your will be done. And would you use our church today and this week to reach the lost and to heal the broken and to make disciples? God is answering your prayers. Mary had to trust and serve her way through the confusion and through nonstop disturbances as they're going to run for their lives from Herod. And then eventually God's going to tell Joseph through another angel, you guys can go back now. And then God's going to kind of direct them exactly where to settle, which is why Jesus ends up growing up in Nazareth. Let's move to Joseph's side of this crazy disruptive story. It's in Matthew 1. Little Bible nerdery for you. Matthew uh, is really a gospel that's written to the Jewish audience in the first century. So that's where Matthew just straight on, Jesus is the Messiah. Because all the Jewish people knew what the Messiah was, the Savior of the world. Luke was written by a Gentile to non-Jewish audience. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, While she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, John, that's impossible. I'm aware. (laughs) I'm aware. And that's kind of the point. This is not a myth. Every city in this story, every ruler in this story is documented. Jesus is one of the most documented people in human history. These are real people. You know, sometimes people, they don't realize the circular reasoning of saying, well, there can't be any miracles because miracles are impossible. And it's like, that's the definition of a miracle, something that's impossible. And that's kind of the whole point of it is that only God could do it. And God doesn't necessarily do miracles like this every day, but he does miracles when and where he wants to, to flex his muscles and show his glory. And it had been prophesied 700 years earlier, if you look back in your Old Testament to Isaiah 7, verse 14, that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. So this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But again, talk about disruption. Talk about this is crazy. Can you imagine what Joseph is thinking and feeling? Just imagine... You're in this shame honor culture. The most honorable thing is to be a good husband, a good wife, good family. You're engaged, and your fiance comes to you, and she says uh, two things. Do you want the bad news first or the good news, you know? Bad news is uh, I'm pregnant, but here's the good news. I have not been unfaithful. It's from God, and it's the Messiah, You know, just imagine that you're Joseph. He's a regular dude. He's like, wow. (laughs) Like, did Mary get hit in the head or what happened, you know? Look at this, verse 19. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. He did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Let's pause there. He decided. You need to know this about the Christmas story. When Mary comes to Joseph and says, I'm pregnant, but it's God, he doesn't say, okay, He decided to break it off. Now he's going to do it as quietly and honorably as possible. He's a good guy. He doesn't want to bring shame on her, but he is not going to marry her. Are you clear on that? He decided. Not he was in the process of deciding. If the story were to end here, Mary and Joseph never get married. Verse 20, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. I want to pause there because some of you, you're in a situation that is confused or disturbed and you don't know, like, what is God's will for me? I thought I'd be married, but I'm single. What's his will? I thought I'd be a parent, but I'm not. What's his will? I thought I'd get the promotion, but I haven't. I thought my marriage would be healed by now, but it hasn't. What's his will? Here's his will. You saw in the previous verse, Joseph was a righteous man. It doesn't mean he was perfect. No one other than Jesus has ever been perfect. What it means is that he lived a lifestyle of obedience to God. A lot of us, we want God to, like, wouldn't it be great if angels from the Lord would appear to me in a dream every time I had to make a decision? Wouldn't that be awesome? But Joseph was already in a lifestyle of doing what the word of God says. That's what righteous man means. So it's not like God picked two random pagans who didn't believe in God and said, I'm going to have the Messiah through you two. 
He says, no, I'm I'm looking for God-fearing people. I'm looking for people who are trying to obey my word. And when you are fearing that is respecting God, and you're trying to live according to his word, not perfectly, but consistently, it's your life theme, then when you reach a crisis like this, do I cut off this engagement or not? God will lead you. He'll lead you as you're faithful to obey what he's already revealed. Does that make sense? I not really make that a point on the screen. I probably should have. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream Quote, Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. This is actually a command. The angel saying, Joseph, Mary, Mary. <laughs> no backing out. And now the angel is going to give him a second command. She will have a son, and you, Joseph, because this was the custom in the culture at this time, You're to give him the name. That was what would happen at this time in history. And that name will be Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So not only does God give Joseph direction, he actually gives him two commands. Marry her, name the baby Jesus. I love verse 24. Might be my favorite verse in the Christmas story. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He obeyed. He takes Mary as his wife. If you keep reading the story, when the baby's born, he names him Jesus. And this is another answer to our question, what can you do when disruption rocks your world? Here's something else you can do. When God reveals some specific thing for you to do, obey without delay. There's a coworker, and you know you're supposed to invite him to the Christmas Eve service. Do it. God put a number in your mind for end of the year giving, because you see that the ministry is expanding, do it. God said, I, I want you to kneel and pray for an hour. Maybe you're not kneeling the whole time, but what I'm saying is there's these nudges from God, that, not from me, from God. We all have them. When you get a nudge like that from God, as long as it aligns with the word of God, right? <laughs> if the nudge is like, hey, leave your wife for a younger woman, you know, that's not from God, Okay. Or like, you know, punch your husband in the face. That, that's not from God, okay? So the, the nudge needs to align with the word of God. And this is where that pattern of Joseph, he's already living a righteous life. As you do that, and as a New Testament believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You'll get these nudges, obey without delay. I, I think I'm convinced we miss out on so much joy and so much fruitfulness Because we get these nudges and we explain them away. Every big leap forward I've had in my life has been a nudge from God that didn't make sense. Go be a pastor for 40 people and quit your job as an award-winning journalist. That didn't make sense. It wasn't easy. It was a process. We had Christians who counseled us in the decision Leave California where you can go to the ocean any day and all your favorite food is like freshly grown. Go live in the middle of a (laughs) cornfield. Didn't make, you know, a ton of sense. I told you last week the story of us adopting our youngest. Every one of those things I've described, those were the greatest decisions of my life. They were nudges from God that the rational part of me could have totally explained away, tried to explain away. And I'm not, I'm, here's the thing, I'm sure I've missed out. I look at the joy that those three decisions have brought and the fruitfulness that they've brought. Man, I don't want to miss a single nudge from God. What if you just prayed that to God right now? Like, God, I don't want to miss a single nudge from you. I'm the Lord's servant. That's my posture, God. Lord, whatever you show me to do, I will obey without delay. I'm going to be like Mary and I'm going to be like Joseph. Joseph obeyed four times out of four. I'll show you one more example. There's four times that these angels appear to him, and you can too. Wouldn't that be great? Let's make this our goal. From right now forward, the next four times God prompts you to do something, let's all go four for four. Wouldn't that be great? Joseph did, and it changed human history. 
You can, and here's what I love. You get to four out of four by starting with one out of one. It just starts there. In fact, I'm going to help you take your one out of one in just a minute here. We're all going to be one for one together. Matthew 2, 14, that night Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary. So this is fast forwarding. It's after Jesus is born. An angel appears to Joseph in a second dream and says, Herod's on his way with an army to kill all the baby boys. It's evil. You got to flee to Egypt. That night Joseph left. Not, I'm going to roll over and see what I feel about this in the morning. That night. Here's the point. When God prompts you, people's lives hang in the balance. I get tearful about the story of that family I showed you earlier in our church because I love them deeply, but also because I know this. As they continue to put Jesus first in their life, it's not just going to change them, it's going to change their kids. And if their kids put Jesus first and he hasn't returned from heaven by the time they have kids, their grandkids, and that's, that's my story. I'm the grandkid of someone who got invited to Jesus. From a family line, the Dickerson family line, there were, there were some intellectual people, but there was alcohol, there was depression. It wasn't a family line you wanted to be born into. Worst thing you can be is a, a somewhat smart, depressed person. It's no, no fun. That's my genetics. That's my background. But in the 1940s, a guy named Earl Peters had the courage to talk to my grandpa when he was in his 20s and invite him to Jesus. And then he became part of a church where people were serving and giving and praying, and they taught him how to read the Bible. And he changed, and he married a Christian woman. That totally changed the way my dad grew up. That changed the way I grew up, to the point that even when I went away as a skeptic for a little while, all those seeds they planted in me, God brought me back. My life is what it is the spiritual and good parts of it because of a guy named Earl Peters who I'll get to meet in heaven but have never met on this earth. God prompted him one day. When God prompts you, people's lives hang in the balance. What he's given to you, whether you've got special gifts in inviting and praying and serving and giving, don't bury it in the ground. Don't hoard it for yourself. People's lives hang in the balance. God chooses and uses those people who consistently Obey without delay. He loves you unconditionally. You're not going to get into heaven because you obeyed perfectly. We can only get into heaven through the work of Jesus, and we receive that as a free gift. We don't earn it. But after you've received that free gift, you do get to decide how much God's going to use you in this world. And it really comes down to, are you a person who obeys without delay? There's this old story of General Patton during World War II. I'll kind of summarize it. He would um, pick leaders this way. He'd get all these candidates together to be a a next, you know, general or someone rising through the ranks. And he'd give them a really silly job, like go behind this warehouse and dig a trench that's exactly these dimensions and only six inches deep. And they'd get back there and From all their training, that trench didn't make any sense. It's not deep enough for a gun embankment. It's not wide enough for this. So most of them are standing around saying that. And finally, one of them just says, hey, I know it doesn't make sense, but this is what he told us to do. Grab your shovels. Let's do it. And he says, that's that's my leader. God, too, is looking for people to whom he can give authority and responsibility. He gives people jobs, and he watches. He watches to see how you respond. Most of all, God's looking for obedience, and he's looking for faithfulness. Joseph had this. Mary had this. Peter lived this way. Peter failed extravagantly a number of times, but his theme was that he would obey without delay. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, fully God but fully human. Father, as he's sweating drops of blood, if there's any other way to redeem humanity, Let this cup of suffering pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Paul the Apostle, same theme. You and me, what if you made this the theme of your life? I want to show you what happens as we collectively, all four chambers, all four of those quadrants, we each 
do what God calls each of us to do, and it's this, it's this spiritual machine, this synergy. That's why 300 people have been baptized here this year. Can we just celebrate that over at Avon? Celebrate with us, 300. Since I've, since I've been here about six years, most years it's like 230 or 215 or 250. 300 is a new record for us. It's amazing. And uh, 30 of those at Avon. Can we give it up for Avon? Way to go, Avon location. Those, those 30 believers wouldn't know Christ if we hadn't stepped out as a movement and said, we're going to try something new. It's a little risky, but we feel prompted by God. We're going to obey without delay. And God keeps reaching people. Avon here. I want to show you just one of those stories of how God rescues and saves through each of us doing our part. Go ahead and take a look. God led me to Connection Point through pickleball. In 2019, my wife was exercising at Connection Point, and when she was there, they were playing pickleball. She decided to try it. She loved it. She came home and told me about it. I decided I'd join her my first time there. I met Mark Marianne Heisman. They had started the pickleball group at Connection Point. They were so patient in teaching us the game and scoring, I really enjoyed it, and I decided I'd start playing. We kept going back, so did everyone else. It went from about 50 people playing to nearly 300 on the list. They began running six courts in the gym and decided they needed some additional volunteers, so several of us stepped up to host different days and nights to help. I played and served as a volunteer host for several years before I actually ever attended church or became a member. One year at Christmas time, my wife Jenny and I were out running errands, and I surprised her by pulling in the parking lot of the church to attend Christmas Eve service. I was in my 60s and have never attended church, but through Mark, Mary Ann's kindness and genuine concern about my faith, I started attending regularly on Sundays with Jenny. I went from someone who wouldn't walk into the church to now being a member and even volunteering to be part of the team that mows the grounds here at the Brownsburg location. My faith is still a work in progress, but I am truly thankful to God for pickleball and wonderful people of Connection Point that have made me feel so welcome. I especially have to be thankful for my wonderful wife, Jenny, for praying for me and hanging in there with me all these years that I didn't go to church and she wanted me to be there with her. I truly am thankful for the people God used to pursue me and for the life-changing invitations to be a part of Connection Point. And that cool? We're glad, we're glad you're part of it too, Kenny. We love you, brother. And uh, this story has all four of those parts in it, right? His wife praying for him for years, people serving. Pickleball's run almost entirely by volunteers. Most of the stuff in our sports and fitness is run by volunteers. Someone invited him. The gymnasium exists because of many of you who have given and who continue to give so we can keep it in excellent condition. Let's choose servants' hearts like Mary and Joseph. I think God's just searching for these kind of groups. And here, uh, two times a year, we kind of have these big pushes where about 9,000 people will come through Brownsburg. And as God entrusts other locations to us, those numbers will grow there, where most Americans will still attend an Easter or a Christmas service if they're invited by someone they know, especially here in Indiana. So our Christmas Eve services... I call them all Christmas Eve, though the first one's December 21st, Thursday night, two there on Saturday, the 23rd, and then four on Sunday. Maybe God's calling you to serve at one of these. It'd be great. I'd love it if you'd serve at Avon. We've got three services at Avon. Avon was, you know, about 100 people last fall, and it's running 350 to 370 this fall. I can't wait to see what they're going to have for Christmas Eve. And then Fishers, man, you talk about confused and disturbed. I did not expect, you know, we were, we're still figuring out Carmel. Where God gave us a building in Carmel, and we're re, in the middle of remodeling that. And then he says, here's another one. Now, there's, the, you guys should know, there's a lot of opportunities God gives us that we say no to. But we've been praying for Fishers. It was literally the next suburb on our list. And it's like, here's a building with 20 people. <laughs> So uh, Fisher's does not need to be remodeled. So it's actually going to have its first service on Christmas Eve. So Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Uh, maybe you just want to go over there and be part of making history, or maybe you want to serve there for that Christmas Eve service. Especially if you live over there, you know people who live over there, invite them to join you. 
Um, and what we're going to do right now is we're going to get our one out of one by filling out these little Christmas cards. So grab your card. You should have one over at Avon. If you're online, I apologize that we weren't able to mail one of these to your house in advance. But, uh, but you could actually still do this. Maybe just grab a piece of paper if you're online. And what we're going to do, you don't need to write a novel. Um, just write a line or two. And of course, the most important decision is who are you going to write it to? Maybe it's someone at the gym where you work out. Maybe it's a Starbucks barista or a coffee barista that you see regularly. Maybe it's one of your kid's teacher's. Maybe you are a student, it's one of your teachers. Maybe you're a teacher, it's one of the parents or a coworker. Could be someone in your neighborhood, someone in your workplace, just someone who, as far as you know, they don't have a vibrant personal relationship with God through Jesus. And what's great about this is you can just write them a little Christmas card that's authentic, let them know something you're grateful for in their life, and then if you're comfortable, you can drop this invite in there. If you're not comfortable, you don't have to. It's still a great Christmas card either way. Um, also, let the Spirit of God lead you. If it's someone who helps you in life, at the gym or at work or wherever else, maybe you pick up a gift card of some kind and you drop that in there with it to sweeten the deal. Let them know that you, generally want to, you genuinely want to give to them in life. So let's just take a couple minutes here. We'll fill these out. I'll be filling mine out as you fill yours out. And we're all going to get to one out of one from this. So it's pretty great. It's the easy one out of one. Got to start you easy, right? there. If you're in the middle of writing a real letter, um, you can take that with you and you can keep writing it. I just wrote, thank you for helping me keep my body healthy. I appreciate all you do to serve me and so many others for a receptionist at the gym where I work out. I always see them on the way in. So Luke 138, Mary responded, I'm the Lord's servant. God, may everything you have planned for my life, may that be my life story. God saves lives and he performs miracles through people who say, I am the Lord's servant. Everything he's given me is to serve him and his work. And Connection Point, I just, I want to encourage you. I know this is the heartbeat of so many of you. I see it when I show up and I see you serving. I see it through our regular giving. I see it as you bring friends and families. I see it as you baptize your kids and your loved ones. As we wrap up here, I just want to ask you, of those four, where has God given you the most? And will you just commit, God, with what you've given me as a, an extrovert or as a person of great faith or someone who's got extra time or I just love to serve, it's so fulfilling, or I know what God's entrusted to me financially. Maybe you think, I, I know it's, above average will you just commit wherever the spirit of God leads you that you'll obey without delay do you want to get to the end of life and look back and realize God entrusted significant gifts to you but you weren't bold enough to give yourself to his work through you do you want to look back on a small life that was really just all about you and your immediate family or, or do you want to stand before Jesus Saved and accepted because of his work on the cross, not your performance, but when he lifts the veil of what really mattered, you look back on a life and you see things that felt like sacrifices in the moment and you realize they were the greatest investments of eternity. 
me pray this for you as we go from here. Father, Lord, we know you've left us on earth to fulfill a mission. The same mission as Mary and Joseph, the mission of the Messiah to bring good news to all people, great joy, eternal life. Lord, we believe your word when it says that if we believe in you, we will have eternal life, but forgive us. We don't often behave as if the other part of that verse was true, that those who don't believe will perish. Those who never hear about you will not have an eternal life with you. And so, Lord, activate us. Holy Spirit, breathe upon us. Activate our gifts of serving, our gifts of giving, our gifts of inviting, our gifts of praying. Lord, every spiritual gift that you've implanted in our body, Holy Spirit, we just invite you to fan them into flame. Make us a beautiful expression of the body of Christ. Jesus, we know you're going to return soon. We don't know the day or the hour, but we can choose that when you do return, we'll be found faithful. Living with the heart of Mary that says, I am the Lord's servant. No matter what disturbances I live through, I'm going to serve God through them. And Lord, living with the faith and obedience of Joseph, that every time you nudge us, we don't explain it away, we don't rationalize it away, we obey without delay, knowing that all of this is yours and for you. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.